Thank you, thank you. Out-of-town guests were commenting on all the singers and musicians and music during the conference, and thanks to all of you that participated in that part of the meeting as well. Romans chapter 1, we got through half a verse this morning. It's uh, pretty good for us. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, we'll start reading at verse 18. Our text tonight is verse 21, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Who would think that wrath would come from heaven? There it is. Revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know, they, They've got the truth, they just don't think it's right. I was thinking this week in our conference, uh, how many people in the world use this phrase, the writing was on the wall? The handwriting was on the wall. That's the Word of God. That's the Bible. Every time they say that, they're, they're acknowledging the Scripture record from Daniel chapter 5. Many of them don't even know that that's, that's what they're saying. They, they, they get an RV and they join the Good Samaritan Club. Don't even know why they call it that. If somebody's broke down by the road, we'll stop and help you. We're in, a, we're in a good Sam club. All those things, all those things. The Bible, the Bible rules the world. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And then here's our verse. Because that, when they knew God... They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We pray You'd bless it to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we do pray, and amen. So, Calvin's system is an unscriptural system. His theology is a false theology. There is a cause for darkness. There is a cause for reprobation. And it's not God. It's man's rejection of God. Man is not born under an uh, eternal decree of damnation. Man brings spiritual darkness and practical wickedness into his life because he doesn't want to give glory to God. That's what the Bible says. When you read in verses 20, uh, 26 about vile affections, and 27 about homosexual behavior, and 28 reprobate minds, and 29, 30, and 31 about this list of horrible, terrible sins, the Bible said those are caused by people not wanting God in their knowledge. They're not caused by a birth condition or a genetic code. They are caused by a decision made by the individual to get rid of God. The Bible says in verse number 21, they became vain in their imaginations. They didn't start out that way. Their imagination wasn't empty. It wasn't void of virtue and righteousness. They made it that way. The Bible says their foolish heart was darkened, which means it didn't start out darkened. They made it that way. The fool hath said, Psalm 14, 1, the fool hath said, in his heart there is no God. He had to say that because it wasn't so. It's not a statement of fact. It is a declaration of belief. The Bible says that every man begins with the knowledge of God in his heart, and the fool says, I do not acknowledge the knowledge. I reject the God-given truth of God. The Bible doesn't say there's no God in the fool's heart. The Bible says the fool hath said that in his heart there is no God. What he's stating is contrary to the fact, but he doesn't want God to be in his heart because he doesn't want to give glory to God. 
And the result of not wanting to give glory to God is that you become reprobate in your mind. That's the situation. You would never have, you would never have justified, praised, legalized, sanctioned, celebrated, and paraded homosexuality if you didn't first have a nation that fell in love with Darwin. If you didn't first have a nation that rejected the authority of the Bible. You don't start out with legalized, praised homosexuality. You start out saying, I don't want to give glory to God. And then your, your mind, your imagination becomes... We were, we were driving yesterday. I hadn't come from the north to the south on 17 through to land in some time. I'd seen that idiotic, moronic, ugly, stupid statue that your tax money bought that's next to the city hall. I hadn't seen the one in front of the Bank of America. This round, womanish looking thing is bent forward with her buttocks facing the door of the Bank of America. What imbecile nation thought it would be a good idea for the customers and employees of a business to walk out the front door and see a woman's hind end uncovered? You know how sick that is? You know how stupid that is? And the morons at the, at the $50,000 a year semester college look at that and call it higher culture. You know what that is? That's the vain imagination of a reprobate mind. And an entire city looks upon that as a drawing card to make people want to come to our town. Right? I mean, they, they don't want you there covered with a scripture sign, but they want a statue of a distorted naked woman with her hind end in the air, because that'll really let the people know that we're a culture city. You understand what that is? That is people who did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now they knew God. Stetson was started as a Southern Baptist school to train preachers. My pastor and I got saved was a, was, a, was a verse by verse expository Bible preacher, graduate of Stetson University. You, you couldn't come close to that place with expository Bible preaching today. But you could put a perverted statue a block away and people walk by it and nobody think anything's wrong with it till I drive by. Look at that trash. Look at that filth. People are crazy. You know how they got there? They didn't want to look up and say, thank you, God. Now, we get, that's this morning's message. We've got to press on into the darkness. <laughs> the Bible says that when men reject the Word of God, the revelation of God, the result is darkness. Everywhere in your Bible you find darkness, it's the result or consequence of a fall. Some people say it's true everywhere except the first time it's mentioned. I believe it's true the first time it's mentioned. Those who hold to the no gap theory say that that darkness came from God as a sign of His creative power. Well, it doesn't come from God as a sign of His creative power anywhere else in the Bible. Everywhere else in the Bible, it comes from God as a judgment upon rebellion and sin and rejection of God. Why wouldn't it be that in the first mention of the thing? Anyway, we don't want to go there tonight. But in Deuteronomy 28, we do want to go there. We'll have a Bible statement on the matter. Nobody before the 19, you can't find anybody before about 1955 that taught the no gap theory. It's a modern thing. Say the no gap theory? Yes, I, that's, I came up with that. Do you know what, well, what are you talking about? Never mind. It's one of those flat earth kind of things. Do you know, oh yeah, what about that? Do you know my 20? When, when you want 10 people to the Lord, we'll, we'll, 
talk about flat earth. Whole world's going to hell, and people want to sit on their computer and argue about whether or not the earth is round. Why don't you get out there and win somebody to Christ? Get out there and do something useful for a change. Because you can't get likes. <laughs> Take those likes down to the store and buy something with them. That's what you want to know what they're worth? Fill a shopping cart up, get in the checkout line, put all the groceries up there, and then just show the, show the girl the cash register, you have 54 likes. That's what they're worth. Anyway, people looking for likes, God's offered them love. Deuteronomy 28, I gotta, get to, I gotta get going on this. Let's just read 27 while we're here because it's such a cool verse. Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, <laughs> whereof thou canst not be healed. I don't want the incurable itch. It's not just any itch, it's the itch. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Lord said, you, you've itched before, but you've never had the itch. <laughs> Say, what is that? I don't know. And I hope I never know. <laughs> Says Chris as he instinctively scratches himself. <laughs> just, just thinking about it. <laughs> All right, now look at verse 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness. There's children of Israel. And blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. They're not blind and it's not dark. It's high noon and the sun is shining. But they're walking around trying to find their way like blind people. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. You know what the Lord said? Darkness descends when God is pushed away. God gave every man light, John chapter 1. We've covered that again and again. When you push out that light or turn out that light, darkness sets in. It's a consequence. It's, a, it's an outworking. Look at Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Acts 26. Covered in the Sunday school hour this morning. Paul's testimony is Paul on the road to Damascus. And he says in verse 16, here's his, here's his ministry once he's saved. But arise, verse 16, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. Both of these things which thou hast seen, of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. You know what it is to be saved? It's to be taken out of darkness and put into light. See that? Beautiful verse. Look in your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. One of the dozens of places where Peter and Paul match perfectly. 1 Peter chapter 2. God said to Paul, go to the Gentiles, and if a Gentile believes, I'll bring him out of darkness and into light. Well, I wonder what strange thing Peter was preaching if uh, Paul was preaching that. Well, here's what he said to people who got saved. Verse number 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Paul preached to the Gentiles. He said, you're in the darkness. You trust Jesus. He'll bring you into the light. When Peter wrote, what well, we write to verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. So when Peter wrote to those same Gentiles after they got saved, he rejoiced, told them to rejoice. God had brought them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. If you're trying to divide Peter and Paul, it's because you're trying to divide a church. All right, so look back in Romans 1. 
Look back in Romans 1. And here's what the Bible says about those who push away God, which in, by so doing they are pushing away the light and end up in darkness. You don't get anything in place of God, you just get darkness. You don't get anything in place of God, you just get a vain imagination. Well, I don't want God, I'll get rid of God and then I'll have, you'll have darkness. Well, I don't want to think about God, I, then I'll have, you'll have vanity in your mind. There's no sufficient substitute for God. There's nothing with which to replace the void that is left when you push God away. Vanity and darkness. That's, why are they groping about? The light's shining and it's noonday. Why are they groping about? They're not blind. Why are they trying to feel and, and find the door? Because without God, there's nothing but void. Chaos, darkness, no substitute for God, none whatsoever. That's why the suicide rate is what it is. That's why the drug addiction rate is what it is. That's why the divorce rate is what it is. That's why the depression rate and then the psych psycho drug rate is what it is. Because people push God away because they didn't want God and they thought they'd find something else in His place and they found nothing. You can't replace God. So 121 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, and other were thankful, but became vain of their imagination, their foolish heart was darkened. 23, they changed the glory of the uncorrupt of God into image, made like the corruptible man. But that image can't love you. That image can't help you. That image can't bring you any satisfaction or joy or peace. So they tried an image like to a bird, a four-footed beast. And a creeping thing. Don't just read the Bible like an American. Look at that Hindu stuff, man. They got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gods that look like everything but God. And they bow down to them and they pray to them and light candles to them. Look at some Bernard and, and, uh, and, uh, and Wayne's pictures from those uh, cathedrals and those uh, Catholic churches over there in Europe. And look at some of the monstrosities carved on the walls and the altars and the, and the edifices of those buildings and the gargoyles and the serpents and the... What are you doing, man? Who builds a church and puts that kind of junk all over it? People groping about in the darkness. People with vain imaginations. So the Lord says this, uh, Wherefore, God also, look, God also gave them up. That's a response. They gave up God, so God gave them up. Calvin's wrong. Calvin's wrong. God's giving over man to reprobate conduct is a response to man's rejection of God. It is not an eternal decree. Wherefore God also gave them up uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. I don't think that's homosexual stuff there. I think that's just hookups and shackups and meetups and rendezvous. And that, that's, just, that's just people pursuing satisfaction through the flesh and for the flesh. And that doesn't do it. No satisfaction there. So they change the truth of God into a lie, worship and serve the creature more to creators, bless forever. For this cause, see, they they broke, they, they got rid of God, so now it's not marriage, it's not modesty, it's not purity, it's not monogamy, it's just sex with anything and everything that moves of the opposite sex, and that didn't make you happy. So now verse 26, for this cause. God then gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women had changed the natural use and that which against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burdened their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. We're not going to stay here tonight. We will in future lessons we'll, when we get to these verses. But look what God said. You are not born that way. 
You become that way when you get rid of God in your thoughts and in your heart. That's what it says. Now, if your parents help you do it, it's going to happen younger and younger. If your school teachers help you do it, it's going to, help you, it's going to happen younger and younger. If you go to a church and the priest teaches you to do it, you're in a bad way. Well, it's not, I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, some of it's people's own sin, some of it's other people's sin, but you didn't start out that way. Now, what, there wasn't a mother in the United States of America 30 years ago that the thought would have ever crossed her mind that maybe my boy's a girl. And maybe my girl's a boy. You have to just plunge deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the God-rejecting darkness to become that stupid. Nobody's that stupid. Unless they've just told God to pack his bags and hit the road. Brothers preaching the other night about Nebuchadnezzar, God taking his mind and he thought he was an, thought he was an ox. Well, what about a man who thinks he's a woman? Isn't that just as insane? What about a woman who thinks she's a man? Isn't that just as, look, something's messed up. If a man's on his hands and knees and thinks he's an ox, he's crazy. If a man's got a dress on and paint in his face and thinks he's a woman, he's out of his mind. Everybody on earth knew that. Till 10 years ago. But now America, they've tried every vanity. They've tried every idol. They've tried every fleshy pursuit. And they're still miserable and suicidal and drug addicted. So let's try changing our gender. It ain't going to work. You're trying to fill a place that only God can fill. You're not going to fill it with, a, with a, someone of the opposite gender, the same gender, changing your gender. The next step's animals. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, Old Testament. Read it or don't read it, but it's there. And that's not going to work for you either. I'm going to marry my cat. <laughs> well, nobody else will have you. You may as well. This world's messed up. You know what the Bible says? 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You think this thing's a mess? You know what the Lord said? Unrestrained sexual immorality is step one. Homosexuality is step two. You haven't even got to the reprobate mind yet. He's already passed homosexuality when he gets to things that are not convenient. I don't want to know what that is. But if, if this country doesn't have a massive repentance from border to border and sea to shining sea, you're going to find out what God's talking about in verse 28. Now Steve might know from Sierra Leone... Brother Sorrell might know from Sri Lanka. Brother Robeson might know from Haiti. You're about to find out in the USA. You say it's dark out there. It's going to get darker. You just keep pushing God out of everybody's knowledge. Look, I, 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 I hope you don't think it's political stuff when I say this. You better thank God. You got a president that speaks about God and Christianity, and the Bible, and a vice president with a testimony of salvation, because this nation is right on the edge of a cliff. It is so dark, and so violent, and so wicked, and God says, you haven't even gotten to the things which are not convenient verse yet. You're just in the homo verse. I'll take any mention of God we can get. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take any mention of, of prayer and righteousness we can get. Amen. This thing's a mess. Now, let's look at the outworking of this thing. 
Turn your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. You say, why you go to these Old Testament passages for, for a, a book in the New Testament? Because in the history of the nation of Israel, you have the final result in, in individuals and in nations of pushing away God and the light of God. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 8. And look what the Bible says in verse number 7. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. You know what God said? You push away God, and not only do you end up worshiping the animals, you become less intelligent than the animals. I mean, they're still doing what God created them to do. Romans 1, man begins to do things God never created him to do or intended for him to do. You sink lower than the beasts. Verse 8. How do you say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is in us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. See what they said? We got the law of God, but men just wrote it. It's just the words of man. See that? In vain made he it, the pen of the scribes is vain. There's nothing to the Bible. There's nothing to the Word of God. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the Word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? You take the Word of God out of somebody's life, there's no wisdom left. Now what happens when people say, I don't want the Bible, men just wrote the Bible, there's nothing to the Bible, I don't need the Bible, verse, verse 10, therefore will I give their wives unto others, and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even to the greatest is given to covetousness, from the prophet even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. You know what you get? You get people who, who, who chase money around the clock, who have money, stacks, and piles of money, and their wife's off with that guy, and their husband's off with that woman, and they're divorced once, divorced twice, divorced three times. You know why? Because they can't fill the place of God with all the things they covet and obtain with their money. There it is right there. Isaiah 47. Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah 47 verse 10. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said... None seeth me. That's the, that's the evolutionary teaching in your society. There is not a God watching me. Nobody sees what I'm looking at on the computer. Nobody sees what I'm doing and listening to in my car. Nobody knows what I'm like in my private hours. Nobody knows what's going on in the thoughts of my mind and in my heart. There, there's no God watching me. Thy wisdom, that kind of thinking, and thy knowledge, that kind of thinking, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. If you get rid of God, then you make yourself God. And that's why people look you in the face and say, I don't see anything wrong with it. Because they're God. They approve of their own actions and there's no higher court of appeal in their life. Jeremiah 8, the Bible's not true. Romans 1, there's no God. Isaiah 47, I'm God. And so the bold, defiant statement from the murderer and the sodomite and the adulterer and the liar and the thief is, who are you to judge me? I am. 
There is none beside me. Well, the Bible says right here, a man wrote the Bible. Can't you see what you're doing to your family? No, I'm free to do what I want to do. No one has the right to judge me. That's not new philosophy, brother. That's not enlightened thinking, sister. God nailed that thing to the wall hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. If you get rid of God, you've got to replace him with something, and eventually that something will be you calling yourself the I Am. Verse 11, therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. And mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off. See that? Don't you just sit around sometimes and say, how did things get this bad? You know what God said? You would say, where did that come from? Nobody ever used to do that. Where did that come from? That never happened in our country before. You want to be God? Then wickedness is going to hit you from every direction so fast, you won't even know what hits you. That's the Bible. Young people, you, you better make a decision. Mom brought you here. Dad brought you here. Right now you're here on their will. You bite a line your will up with God and God's word because you get rid of God, there's nothing to take his place but trouble and darkness and misery. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. All right, back to Romans 1. I don't like that negative preaching. It's not negative preaching. This is positive preaching. When it hits negativity, it, it appears to be negative, but there's, not, there's nothing negative about this preaching. This, it's all positive. This is God trying to keep you from a rattlesnake's nest, from drinking poison, shooting yourself in the face. It's all positive. It's all positive. You sure about that? Yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> Romans 1.21, uh, the glorified mouths God and I was thankful became vain in their imaginations. There are over 40, I, 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 think it's, I think it's 44, but there are over 40 Bible references to man's imagination. Every one of them says it's no good. Every one of them says no good. So, so get this. I'm, I'm a trained, educated educator with a master's degree. Instead of teaching children correct grammar and correct mathematics and correct history and correct social studies, my job really is to help them imagine. Imagine having a diploma you can't read. Imagine 12 years of school and not, nobody on earth would hire you to do anything because you can't do anything. I can draw a rainbow pony, good. <laughs> City of Deland will buy one and stick it in front of a building somewhere. Other than that, your imagination's not worth much. We don't need your dreams. We need facts. Facts. Bible said, Bible said he'll give them over to vain imaginations. Here's what, here's what God told you to do, 2 Corinthians 10. Bible now, come on, Bible, we're looking at the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse number 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what God said? If you have an imagination, take what you imagine and cast it at the feet of Jesus Christ and let the Word of God control it. 
and what doesn't line up with the Word of God, lock it up and throw away the key and don't let it out. Don't you think it's amazing that the worldwide anthem of Christ-rejecting, Bible-rejecting sinners is a song called Imagine. It's not an accident. That devil-possessed reprobate got that, got that song from Satan directly and gave it to the world, and the world through their, their collective consciousness around it and held it up and said, we defy God, there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell, I am the I am. And they called the song Imagine. As if that would disprove the Bible. And all it did was shout out in ten foot tall letters, God saw you coming! He told us if we ever ran into a reprobate that was trying to replace the empty place, uh, trying to place God in the empty place in his life, he would try to do it with imagination. God saw you coming. Before you ever smoked that dope and did those drugs and beat your wife, Mr. Lennon, God saw you coming. We're not buying it. We're not buying it. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. Bible, 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 Bible. Amen. Say, is that all you got? Yeah. Booze, booze, booze. Is that all you got? Yeah. Yeah. Drugs, drugs, drugs. Movies, movies, movies. Is that all you got? Yeah. I'm happy you're not. I'm content you're not. I got peace you don't. I got joy you don't. Why are you criticizing me? Why don't you shut up and listen? Yeah. I don't need a drug to go to class, and a drug for after class, and a drug for study time, and a drug for sleep time, and a drug for wake up time. Yeah. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. You know what this... this College crowd thinks, you know this, world, this, this worldly crowd thinks, you know what they think? They think that if they think it, that makes it right. You know what that is? That's the vanity of their mind. You know, 40 years ago, if somebody said, my dog talks to me, they would try to get you some help. If you met somebody that said, I can't eat a meal in a restaurant unless I got my dog in my lap, they would have got you to a doctor. They wouldn't have made everyone else put up with your, with your dog's unwashed bottom sitting on a restaurant chair. Somebody's crazy. Well, I think, we don't care what you think. It's the vanity of mind. We're not going to shape our nation and our families and our future on the basis of what you think. But that's the society you live in. Do you understand what a, what a freak show you are to this world? You have an authority that you live by and things that are true and that are right that actually go against you? Somebody said Friday night, said, how strange it is we came here for, for three mornings and three nights and spent all day listening to men tell us we're full of pride and we need to repent, and we loved it. You know why? Because we don't walk in the vanity of our mind. There's something in there. <laughs> we can evaluate life and see what's harming us and harming our family and harming our friends and try to fix it, not demand that everybody accept it. Verse 18, having, now look, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, 
because of the blindness of their heart. God didn't make them that way. God didn't make them that way. They had understanding and it was darkened. They had a relationship to God, but they were alienated from Him. Their heart could see truth, but they blinded themselves. That's not Calvinism. Because your oft-repeated behavior toward God caused the conduct in which you now find yourself living. As the Bible says. Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. Look, if you can't help it, then God's the guilty one. If you were made that way, then God's the guilty one. If you brought it on yourself by rejecting God, you're the guilty one. It's two different, two different worldviews. Our worldview is there's a God on the throne and I'm guilty. The other worldview is I'm on the throne and God's guilty. That's just how it is. I, I've told you this before. I, I, I never was thankful for it, but I am now. I was growing up. I, I, I was not thankful for this, but I am now. There were two things my father would not allow me to say, and if I said them, he would discipline me in ways that you would think were out of, out of measure. I was not allowed to say it was not my fault. If I ever said it's not my fault, I was punished. And if I ever said I couldn't help it, he would in the midst of making me feel the pain say, you better find a way to help it. I still hear, right now, I can hear him saying that. I can, I can feel his loving hand upon my arm right about here. And, and from somewhere back there, I can hear him say, you better find a way to help it. You know what that is? That's a God-centered worldview. That's not the guy whose mother looks in the camera and knows her son has 27 felony counts against him. And as the blue lights are flashing, says, he's a good boy. The police just out to get him. No, you're an idiot. Your son's not a good boy. He hasn't been a good boy since he was three years old. And they bring in some guy that helped him commit the first five crimes. Said, oh, I've known him all my life. He's a pretty good guy. Compared to you. <laughs> not compared to God. All right, Isaiah 4. We've got to press on here. Isaiah 44. It's tough getting through Romans. There's... <laughs> a lot in here. Romans 44, 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. See, now it's gone farther. Now, it's not just vanity in your mind. Now your whole life is vanity. There's nothing of worth left in someone that we learned in December was formed and fashioned by God and wonderfully made. You talk about decline. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. Their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. That, that is, the graven image that a man makes witnesses against the man that made it. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. You know why people like idols instead of God? The idol doesn't shame them for their misbehavior. The Buddha statue never says you shouldn't have done that. The Mary statue never says you need to repent. That's why people like them. They don't care if it snows or freezes as long as they got their plastic Jesus. Because that little, that little glow-in-the-dark figurine on the dashboard is not going to tell you, you know, you really need to slow down. Who hath formed a God, small g, or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows should be ashamed of the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up. Yea, or yet let, they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. 
The smith with the tongs, both worketh in the coals, and fashion it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. You're going to make a God? You can't even skip lunch. If you don't stop and drink some Gatorade, you're going to pass out. And you're going to make a God? Lord's right in this, like, you, you know how dumb that is? 13, the carpenter stretcheth out his rule, he maketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with planes, and he maketh it out with a compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. That pretty man you made, he ain't walking, he's not going to mow your yard, he's not going to wash your windows, he can't even go get your mail out of the mailbox. All he can do is just stand there where you put him. 14, he heweth him down cedars, and taketh cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn. That's good planting. You're going to need firewood. You're going to need a cook stove. Plant you some trees. For he will take thereof, and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god, and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast, and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself, and saith, Aha, I am warm. And then he writes a song. I saw the light, I saw the light. <laughs> I have seen the fire. See, he burns part of it. Now he's not cold anymore. He burns part of it, cooks some food, eats some food, and he looks in the fire and says, you must be God. No, it's a piece of wood, you dummy. That's all it is. If it's a God, you just burn two-thirds of your God. And the residue thereof he maketh a God. Even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. It's like he smokes three fourths of it and then worships the butt of the thing. <laughs> they, yeah. they have not known nor understood. For he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their heart that they cannot understand, and none considereth in his heart that there is knowledge, nor understand, neither is there knowledge or understanding to say, I burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? You see that? This guy is worshiping the charcoal briquettes that are left over from his fire. And he looks at his hand, and he looks at his other hand. Romans 1 said, in this hand he had the truth of God, and he didn't want it. Now in this hand he has a lie, and he can't even see that he's lying to himself. You compare that hand of Romans 1 to that hand in Isaiah 44, and you will know why it's so hard to witness to people now. They have so dropped the truth of God from one hand and they are clinging so tightly to a lie in the other hand they can't even see that they're lying to themselves. It's not higher education. It's written in the Bible in 714 B.C. Some book you got there. Ecclesiastes 7.29. Just uh, three more verses tonight. Ecclesiastes 7.29. Proverbs, there it is. Ecclesiastes 7, 
Verse 29. Here it is again. Same truth. You believe in Calvinism? You'll have to get this verse out of your Bible. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. You know what Romans 1 says about the reprobate mind? Inventors of evil things. How'd man start out? Upright. How'd he get down in the sewer? He didn't want God. He wanted to invent a substitute for joy, a substitute for peace, substitute for love, substitute for hope, substitute for goodness, substitute for righteousness, a substitute for God. And it all turns to sin because there's nothing to it. It's vanity. All flesh, no spirit. Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah 2, here it is again, verse number 5, matching Romans 1. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me? Which means what? They started out right next to him. But they went away from God because they found they said, God, God's the one with the iniquity, not me, God. I'm right, God's wrong, I'm leaving God. See the verse? Thus said, Lord, what iniquity of your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. They did not start out with a vain mind, and a vain heart, and a vain life. They got there walking away from God. It's Romans 1. All right, one more passage, 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. Nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Amen? Law, covenant priesthood, altar, sacrifice, miracles, Moses, Abraham, whole works. 2 Kings 17, verse 14, or, or uh, let's see, 13. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according to the law which I commanded your fathers, which I sent you by my servants, the prophets, notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks, like to the neck of their fathers, that did not believe in the Lord their God. Where did the hardened neck come from? They did it to themselves, because they wouldn't believe in God. 15. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. See the problem? They've got the word of God, but it goes against things they want to do. So they get rid of God, they get rid of the word of God, and they think we'll keep the blessings of God, but not the commandments of God. You know what that is? That's vanity. Because you can't do that. Watch it, watch it, watch it. And his testimonies testified against them, and they followed vanity and became vain. That's Romans 1.21. They got God, they don't want God, they get vanity instead. And went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them, they should not do like them. And... Next verse of Romans, here it is, 2 Kings 17, 16. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images. Two calves and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. See that? We got God, we don't want God because God has commandments and we don't want commandments. So we get rid of God 
and now we become vain. We think God's going to bless us. We're going to get his blessings, but we're not going to keep his commandments. And then when they don't get the blessings, then they turn to other gods and idols to try and recover the blessing. Romans 1. And where do they end up? 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord God to provoke him to anger. Now comes the outworking of the reprobate mind. We'll murder our children. We'll get involved in witchcraft and sorcery. We'll sell our, we'll give every dollar we have in the world and every spare minute of time we have to sin. There it is. Now the reason you have all this history of Israel in the Old Testament is so that if you read in the New Testament what happens to people who don't like to retain God in their knowledge and you're tempted to think it won't end up like the Bible says it will, you can go back and see how it ends up. It ends up like the Bible says it will. Now one more tie into our Bible conference and then, then we'll, we'll go on our way for this evening. Come to Daniel um, chapter 6. Verse 24, brother, brother, before you decide, I'm, I'm tired of the Bible, I'm tired of that preaching, I'm tired of that narrow way. Verse 24, the king commanded, they brought those men which had accused Daniel, they cast them in the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives. Those men's opposition to God destroyed their wives and destroyed their children. Their wives and children ended up in the mouth of a roaring lion because the head of the home opposed God. You got a life to live, don't let yourself be plunged into darkness. Do you have a marriage? Do not let your marriage be plunged into darkness. You have children, don't let your children be plunged into darkness. Let God be God and submit yourself to His commands so that you may enjoy His blessings. Do not dismiss God and think, I won't have this God commanding me, but I'll have the blessings of God. You will end up with vanity and you will end up with darkness and then you'll begin the steps toward reprobation and destruction. That's Romans 1. Let's be thankful this morning. Let's give God praise this morning. And that, that's the sure, absolute sure way to ward off the destructive, ruinous darkness that comes into the heart, the mind, the life, the nation that rejects God. You ought to thank the Lord you're in a church that take this kind of preaching. Few and far between, but this is, this is absolutely right. Everything you, you see out there that's wrong, it's, it's Romans 1. Foretold, foretold how you'd get a country to the place where it is. It's right there in Romans 1. Don't be part of it. You can't keep the nation going that way. You can keep yourself, your family, your home from going that way. Amen. Father, bless your word to our hearts tonight. Help us to believe it, every bit of it. Act upon it with sincerity, with fervency. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a great week. Hope to see many of you tomorrow night in the Bible school class. Bye-bye.